and she was getting it in. I was gonna get up, I was gonna get up and help her out. Praise God. We will now dismiss our children to youth church. All of our, I think it's five to 15. I may be wrong, is that right? I guess. Amen. Please turn with me to 2 Samuel 13. Second Samuel chapter 13. I'll be reading from the American Standard. 2 Samuel chapter 13. Now it was after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And Abnon, the son of David, loved her. Abnon was so frustrated of, this, of his sister Tamar that he, that he made himself ill. For she was a virgin, and it seemed hard to Amon to do anything to her. But Amon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shemiah, David's brother, and Jonadab was a very shrewd man. He said to him, O son of the king, why are you so depressed morning after morning? Will you not tell me? Then Abnon said to him, I am in love with Tamar, my sister of my brother Absalom. Jonadab then said to him, lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. When your father comes to see you, say to him, please let my sister Tamar come and give me some food to eat, and let her prepare the food in my sight, that I may see it and eat it from her hand. So Abnon lay down and pretended to be ill. When the king came to see him, Abnon said to the king, please let my sister Tamar come and make me a couple of cakes in my sight, that I may eat from her hand. Then David sent to the house for Tamar, saying, go to your brother Abnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her to to her brother Abnon's house and prepared food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Abnon's house and he was laying down and she took dough, kneaded it, made cakes in his sight and baked the cakes. She took the pan and dished them out before him, but he refused to eat. And Abnon said, have everyone go out from me. So everyone went out from him and Anmon said to Tamar, bring the food to, into the bedroom that I may eat from your hand. So Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them into the bedroom to her brother Abnon. When she brought them into him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, come lie with me, my sister. But she answered, no, my brother, do not violate me for such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do this disgraceful thing. As for me, where could I rid of my repro reproach? And as for you, you will be like one of the fools in Israel. Now therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withheld, withhold me from you. However, he would not listen to her. Since he was stronger than she, he violated her and laid with her. Then Amnon hated her with a very great ha hatred, for he hated with which he had. Then Abnon hated her with a, gr a very great hatred, for the hatred with which he had hated her was greater than the love which he had had loved her. And Amnon said to her, get up, go away. The word of God. Our Father and our strong God, we thank you and we adore you and love you and give you praise for being who you are in our lives. And Lord, my prayer is that you would allow 
your spirit to anoint me at this strategic hour to preach and to teach your holy word with supernatural power. In Jesus' name, we say hallelujah. We are uh, continuing our series on family matters, on relationships, and in light of that, I, you're already in 2 Samuel 13. Look at verse 1, the latter part of verse 1, it says, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Look at verse 15, and we think, Minister Carla for reading so well. But verse 15, it says, Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was great, greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. You see that? I want to talk about it's a thin line between love and hate. It's a thin line between love and hate. How does it happen? How does that one go from love, loving someone deeply and dearly, to hating them with venom and hatred? And vitriol, rather. How, how does it go from the person you couldn't wait to be in their presence to now you can't stand being in their presence. How, how does it happen? How, how does it go from a little house on the prairie to a nightmare on Elm Street? How, how does that happen? How does that happen a marriage that is so blissful and a match made in heaven to, to now a marriage marred by hell. How, how, does that, how does that happen? From love to, to hate. When I was uh, a child growing up in Indianapolis, Indiana, July 4th, we would go to what's called Connor Prairie. It's this, it's this land where they would, you know, uh, dress up in the olden times, times from 1700s, 1800s. And on July 4th, we would watch the fireworks and we loved it. They, you know, of course, share with us the importance of Independence Day, history of the nation and all of that, Revolutionary War, all of that historical, wonderful historical information. But then we'd watch these fireworks, this wonderful, exciting fireworks show and display. But what I noticed about that is that the fireworks would go up so quickly and then they go down quick. And all that was left was some trash that other, that other people had to pick up. And y'all, that happens in relationships. That it starts out with so much, so much excitement, so much, so much noise, and, 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 and after a while, it just fades off. So when we first see you with that person you love, you know, you with them and it's exciting, y'all holding hands, everything great, and then just a, just a few days later, you know, they're not there. What, what happened? You said, I got to let them go. I had, to, I had to get rid of them. So it goes out just as quickly as it went up. And then someone has to come behind and clean up the trash. What? How, how does that happen? Now, I know there are different expressions, different experiences, different events in different relationships. I'm not talking about what's going on with you. I'm talking about in, in 2 Samuel 13. Um, so you can stop looking at me like that, all right? <laughs> but but, but um, what happened in 2 Samuel 13 was that Amnon was in love with this young lady named Tamar. And Tamar had, had position because she was a princess. She's a son of King David. She's a pretty woman. The King James Version says fair, but that really doesn't do it justice. She was, she was beautiful. She was gorgeous. And then uh, she was pure, so she was a virgin, so she had her purity. And then she was a practical woman because it said she could cook. So she had all of that. She had position. She was pretty, pure, and practical. 
and Amnon started out in love with her. But 15 verses, 15 short verses later, he went from loving her to hating her. And he hated her worse. His hatred was more intense in verse 15, the Bible says, than his love for her in verse 1. How did that happen? I want to suggest that Hamnon didn't love her in the first place. I ain't going to be long today, so y'all uh, just, just bear with me for a few minutes, but I won't be long. But I want to suggest, I know it said he loved her, but I want to suggest that Hamnon didn't really love Tamar to begin with. I know it said he was. I know he said he did, but I want to suggest that he didn't. Here's why. I, I want to nominate a few reasons why, why I don't believe he loved her. First of all, I did, he didn't love her because it says he was frustrated in verse 2. Verse 2 says, and Hamnon was so vexed. Uh, that, that word, he was distressed. Uh, he was in a tight, in a jam. Every time he saw her, she, was, she, uh, she frustrated him. Y'all, Love does not frustrate. Love frees. The Bible said God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and that didn't frustrate us. It freed us. Y'all, every time you around that person, you frustrated. it. That ain't love. I don't believe he loved her. He was frustrated. He's vexed. He's distressed. He's, 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 he's upset every time. He's, that's, not, that's not love. And then, and then it says that, that, that he fell sick for his sister Tamar for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. What do you mean he'd do anything to her? He was thinking sex all the way. All he wanted to do was take her to bed. And y'all, when you relegate what you want to do, what you want from somebody is just something you, something you can get from them or something you can do to them. Y'all, that ain't love. That ain't real love. Y'all, um, yeah, y'all, love is not about what you can get from somebody. Love is about what you can give. How do you know that? What I just said, John three sixteen. for God so loved the world, watch this, that he gave. Love is about giving, not about receiving. When you go into a marriage, you can't be, it's going to be 50-50. No, you, you don't go in thinking it's 50-50. You got to go thinking it's 100 and nothing. Because there may become a point where the person cannot give back to you like you've given to them. That's why the vow says sickness and health, richer and poor. Because what if they can't work? What if they sick and can't give back to you? It's not 50-50, it's 100, and it's, it's, it's all the way. You got to be thinking, I'm going to give all the way, even if I'm the only one giving, and knowing that you reap what you sow. That's, that's what real love is about, y'all. And y'all, love is not about emotion. Love is not about how you're feeling. Love is not a feeling you felt that you ain't never felt before. Y'all, y'all, this is what love is. Love is a minimum of emotion and a maximum of assessing one's need and meeting that need in a spirit of self-sacrifice even when you don't feel like doing it. No, that, 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 that's what love is. Love is a minimum of emotion. It ain't about how you feel. It's a maximum of assessing one's need. What is the need? And I meet that need in a spirit of self-sacrifice when I don't feel like doing it. That's what Jesus did. Jesus loved us. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. Well, what did he do? He saw our need. We were sinners in need of a savior. He assessed that need, that he met that need in a spirit of self-sacrifice. I know he sacrificed because he sacrificed his own life. Even when he didn't feel like doing it, and he didn't feel like doing it because in the Garden of Gethsemane, he told his father, there's any other way we can do this. Let this cup pass from me. He didn't feel like doing it, but he said, yeah, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Love is not about your emotion. It ain't about what you feel. Love is an act of your will. It's about your volition. You got to make a decision to love somebody. I decide to love you. I decide to assess your need and meet that need. It's, it's not your friend. No, and then when Jesus tells us love our enemies, he's not saying be emotionally attached to your enemy. 
It's an act of your will, y'all. Ain't how you feel. Sometimes couples come to me and they say, uh, well, I just, I just don't love my spouse anymore. I'm just not, no, no, they say, I'm just not in love with them anymore. And I look at them and I say, well, you didn't think that was going to last, did you? <laughs> and they say, well, what do you mean? I said, no, be, this, this warm, fuzzy, in love feeling, that don't last. Y'all, love is about a commitment. Love is about a decision. And watch this, when you fall out of love, real love keeps you there till the feeling come back. Oh, I wish I had somebody today. I wish, you, I wish you'd understand what I'm trying to talk about. That when you ain't feeling and things ain't going well, you don't bail out. Say, I stay here until it, till it works itself out. That it's a decision of your will. He, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't buy it. Amnon didn't love her. He said he loved her, but he didn't love that girl. He was frustrated. The second reason I don't think he loved her is because he was fake. I'm in verse 5. I'm not making it up. It says, And Jenadab said unto her, Lay thee down on thy bed. Make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come and give me meat and dress the meat in my sight that I may see it and eat it at her hand. Now, here's the thing that's going on. Uh, Amnon wants Tamar, but he's frustrated. He don't know how to go about it. Well, he has a friend, it's really his cousin, Jenadab, who's crafty. He's sneaky. He's conniving. He's calculating. And he says, you know, he, you know Amnon is sick, and he's, he's, just, he's just frustrated. And, and, and um, Jenadab said, what's wrong with you, man? Why are you so sick? What's wrong with you? Why are you going around so sad? You don't even understand who you are. You, you the prince. Your daddy is the king. You, you, you have the full, your daddy runs this place. Why are you sick? And he starts explaining to him what's going on. Jenadab says, oh, I got something for that. All you got to do is act like you're sick. And when your dad comes to see you and say what's wrong, you tell him you need Tamar to cook some food for you. When she cooked the food, then she come in your bedroom, then you can make that move. Now, if I had time, I'd tell you, be careful about your friend's advice. I don't have time to run that rabbit. My time is running. But, but be careful where you get your advice from. Because he was, it says he was crafty. He was, he was crafty. He was calculating. He was sneaky. So he obviously going to come up with a sneaky plan. But that don't mean it's the right plan. But here's the issue with this. is now he's operating in deceit and pretense. He can't be honest with Tamar. He got to come up with a plan of deceit in order to, in order to establish what he, what he thinks is love. Uh, you got to be open and honest about yourself. His identity, his, his name, actually the name Hamnon means faithful. He's faithful, but he's acting phony. His name is not matching his nature. Be careful when your name does not match your nature. When your identity is not reality. That's true of us as believers in Christ. The Bible says, if my people that are called by my name, our name ought to match our nature. If we're true believers in Christ, it ought to affect our conduct. It ought to have an impact on our conversation. It ought to have an impact on how we live. But now he's not honest. He's, he's fake and he's, he's phony. He tries to pretend like something he's not. Does not ha that, that not happen in relationships? But you claim you love her, Amnon? If you love her, then why can't you be honest with her? If you love her, why can't you tell her how you really feel? Amnon, if you love her, why can't you be open and, and upfront with her? Amnon, if you love her, why can't you tell her where you really work? Amnon, if you love her, why can't you tell her how many kids you really have? Amnon, if you love her, why can't you tell her where you're really going? 
If you love her, why can't you tell her where you really came from? Why can't you be upfront with us? This is like the first date. So I ain't saying, you know, the first date you go on, you share everything. You know, I ain't saying the first date you're going, well, you know, I've been in jail 10 times. I got eight kids. Uh, I've been strung out. I've been sober for three months. Uh, I got five baby moms. I ain't saying all I ain't saying just share that on the first date, all right? You don't share it all at the beginning. That may, that probably ain't going to be no second date if you share all that. You know, keep something. But my point is, it's about honesty. It's about openness. If you want your relationship to flourish and not fail. Does it not say that in Genesis 2? The first couple, Adam and Eve. Around verse 26 it says, And they were naked and not ashamed. (laughs) Which means they were open, they were exposed to each other, but they weren't ashamed about it. No shame. I can be upfront, I can be open and honest with you, and there's not any shame. And that openness and that honesty. Uh, Want to be open and honest with each other. There's, there's, a, there's an issue, brothers, and we can't be open and honest with our women. That's a problem. And sisters, you should want openness. Because if you're not careful, some brothers will wear, wear a mask. San Jose. The San Jose Sharks, it's a hockey team. Uh, I like all kinds of sports. San Jose Sharks, they have a, a, a routine they go through at the beginning of the game. Like most sports teams, they bring the team, introduce the players, uh, at least the, the, the starting lineup. Everybody's, they hype the crowd. And everybody's ex- all excited. And then they have a mascot that's a shark. It looks like a shark. And they normally bring him down from the ceiling on this rope. Well, in one particular game, they had introduced all of the players. They were skating around the rink, and they brought down the mascot. But for some reason, there was a malfunction in the rope, and he only could come halfway down. He wasn't far enough to jump off onto the skating rink, so he was just suspended in the air. Well, apparently what they decided to do is, since they couldn't take him all the way down, they took him, they drew him right back up. The only issue was to get to the very top where he started, he had to go over this railing. And they didn't want to do it because they don't ever want you to know who the person is. But in order to get over the railing, he had to take off his mask. They didn't want to do it. But if he was going to get to this railing on top, he had to take off the mask. Now, sisters, before some brothers get over a certain railing with you, you need to make sure their mask is off. And it takes some time to to get over the mask. And no matter how high you are, before they can get over some levels with you, they need to take off the mask. But wait a minute. It ain't just men that wear masks. Some women can wear some masks too. Oh, preach, Pastor Johnson. Preach it all. Preach it all. Preach it all. Don't get, don't get quiet on me now. Don't get quiet now. Some women can wear masks. Women can be dishonest. (laughs) Oh, I just lost, I just lost all the way. Oh, y'all was, y'all was amen and real good. I just, I just lost you. Just lost, just like that, I lost it. Man, you got to be careful. You look under the mask too. You may wind up with something you didn't think. I'm in the Bible. Genesis 29, uh, Jacob is in love with this girl named Rachel, and he asked her daddy Laban for her. He says, well, if, you're gonna, if, you're gonna, if I'm going to give you my daughter, you got to work for me seven years. So on the night of, before the wedding, Jacob gets drunk, goes out with his buddies, parties too much, gets drunk. Laban, who's sneaky, shifts and takes Rachel, and instead of putting Rachel there, that's under this veil, he puts his oldest daughter, Leah. Jacob too drunk to realize it ain't who he thought it was. This is in the Bible, Genesis 29. He consummates the relationship. The next morning he wakes up and looks and discovers it's not Rachel whom he thought he was married, but it's Leah who he did not want. Brothers, make sure you stay sober enough. (laughs) 
I know you want to have your fun, but make sure you stay clear-headed enough. Because you may wake up in the morning. No, 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 don't worry about that. (laughs) Oh, don't worry about that. Oh, let's move on. Let me see. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Amnon, it said he loved her. I don't believe he loved her. I don't believe he loved her because he was frustrated. I don't believe he loved her because he was fake. But also, lastly, I don't believe he loved her because he was acting a fool. Verse 12. And she answered him, Nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly foolishness. And while she says, and I, whether shall I cause my shame to go, and as for thee, thou shalt be as one, watch this, of the fools of Israel. Now y'all, when the woman you're trying to get with call you a fool, you a fool. She said, we can't, we can't do this. She said, first of all, because of who you are. She said, you... You're the, you're, the, you're the prince. You're the king's son. And as the king's son, some things we should not do. Do you realize who you are? When you know who you are, it's some things you would not do. He, he, she, she's because she, he, he wants he, he wants her he wants her and he's, she's trying she appeals to his person she starts there with just who he is his person she says wait a minute Let, let's be clear about who you are you you the, you the prince and the prince shouldn't be involved in nothing like this there's something we got to do this the right way in fact she says let's go talk today let's go talk to the king and and, and he'll give us permission and we'll do this the right way not the wrong way and it was he's, she's trying to appeal to his personhood for him to really understand who he is because when you know who you are it ought to affect what you do and it's the same thing for you and me when we know who we are and whose we are It impacts what we do. Well, who are we? Well, the Bible says you are a chosen generation. You are a peculiar person. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. That's who you are. You are above and not beneath. You are the head and not the tail. The Bible says you are more than a conqueror. In fact, look at your neighbor and ask him, do you realize who you are? And when you know who you are, you, everybody can't do anything to you. Everybody can't talk to you any kind of way. Everybody can't treat you any kind of way. When you know who you are. You need to know who you are. Own who you are. And it impacts what you do, but it also impacts what you allow other people to do to you. You can't lie to me. You can't cheat on me. You can't, you can't treat me like dog. No, you will. You will not call me that kind of name. You will not. No, you will not wear that kind of. No, we ain't. No. You, uh, you, I, I, I thought you knew. I thought you understood. That I have self-esteem. You need to let somebody know when they try to dog you out or look down on you or condescending towards you. No, 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 no. You won't treat me like that. You need to understand who I am. Tell me what you bring to the table. What I'm bringing to the table. I am the table. What am I bringing to the table? I thought you knew. I am the table. (laughs) 
touch two people and say, I am the table. I, I am the table. Who you, what am I bringing to? I'm bringing me. And when I show up, it's the best thing you done ever seen. It's the best thing you done seen in your life. And if you don't want me, it's your loss, not mine. Because I know who I am. I know, oh, I wish I had somebody that understood who they were in Christ Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Come on, put your hands together and give God praise. That's, that's enough. I'll finish the rest next week. Know who you are. Know who you are. Love who you are. Yes, yes. Where, where does, where does yes, love start? Lord. Where does love start? That somebody said it, with yourself. Love starts with yourself. Jesus said, love your neighbor. How? As you love yourself. Start loving yourself. And when you love yourself, you in a better position to love somebody else. Amen. Amen. As we stand. Now Amnon, it says Amnon was, was a fool. But, but unfortunately, there's, there's somebody that's acting foolish in here. What do you mean by that? The psalmist says the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. The fool acts like they don't need God. The fool acts like they don't need Jesus. They can make it on their own and their own reason and own resolve. Don't be foolish today. If you've not accepted Christ as your Savior, make a wise decision. Make a prudent decision today to invite him into your life. You're not a part of the church. You need a church home. Make a wise decision today. God has designed this, that you believe in Jesus, but also belong to his church. Believe and belong. Maybe you strayed away and you need to get back in right fellowship with God and his church. Maybe you're a college student. Maybe you're away from your home and you're here temporarily and you just want spiritual covering while you're in Albany. You can have it right here at Metropolitan. Just step to the nearest aisle and come down. Who's going to make that decision today? Who's going to do it today? Don't let anything keep you from becoming a part of Christ church, for having him in your life. Won't you come today? We're going to sing and give you a chance to come. Just step to the nearest aisle. Come on, we offer Christ today. Come on, come on, come on.